I am delighted to have with us Suzanne Fraser. And Suzanne Fraser is a co-founder and president of Beach Environmental Awareness Campaign Hawaii. That's B-E-A-C-H, Beach. An award-winning nonprofit organization she co-founded with Dean Otsuki in 2006. There is Dean. The purpose of Beach is to inspire actions on an individual and community level that reduce and prevent marine debris, resulting in protection for Hawaii's marine life, seabirds, and ocean and coastal environment. Suzanne and Dean received the 2006 Living Reef Award for going above and beyond in their actions to protect the reef, and Beach received the 2012 Marine and Coastal Zone Advocacy Council Douglas Tom Award for preserving and protecting Hawaii's marine and coastal environment and actively engaging the community, especially youth, among various other awards and recognitions. So we're very delighted to present to you Suzanne Fraser, and her title of her talk today is Why I Don't Eat Fish. Aloha and Happy New Year to everybody. Being vegan has been a gradual journey for me, starting in childhood when I became mostly vegetarian, but I still like to eat all kinds of seafood and fish. However, 12 years ago, that all changed for me when I found out what was going on in the ocean and with marine life. And then I could no longer be part of the problem and I stopped eating fish and seafood for good. Two years after that, I stopped eating dairy, so I've been a vegan for the past 10 years. Um, to me, I think being vegan is more than what you eat and what you wear. Um, it's a lifestyle also. In my opinion, it's about not doing harm to other beings. One of the ways to do that is not to kill them or eat them or wear them or use products from animals. Um, but today I'm going to be speaking about why not to eat fish on a broader sense. So why did I stop eating fish and seafood 12 years ago? Well, Dean and I went for a walk on the beach. It was Waimanolo Beach. And we were looking for a nice flat sandy beach to walk half an hour one way and turn around, walk half an hour back the other way because I'd heard that an hour walk was a healthy thing to do. And we couldn't even walk 30 minutes without bumping into plastic. There was marine debris everywhere. And a lot of it was little tiny pieces of plastic. And that was what concerned me the most because the large items are easy to pick up and get rid of. But the tiny pieces, how do you clean that up? You know, and there was just so much of it. And I was also wondering, why is it all white and blue? If you can look at the picture there, you'll see the, where's the red and the pink and the yellow and the orange? All the bright colors seem to be missing. And later on, I realized after studying this problem of marine debris that the bright colors were being eaten and what washes up is what's left over after marine life eat the rest. And then examining the plastic bottles, oh, here's another picture of another dirty beach. This one is Hanama Bay. Um, so we were examining these plastic bottles that we were picking up, and it was very obvious that they're being eaten. You can see the bite marks and the beak marks where animals and birds have been eating pieces or attempting to eat them. In the 12 years I've been working on this problem of plastic marine debris through removing, sorting, and researching it, there's never been a time when I haven't seen eaten plastic bottles. So I was really disgusted by what I saw on both the beach and in the ocean. I'm going to show you a few more eaten bottles here. And this is a, um, a photo of Camillo Beach, which was so horrifying to go visit. Not only is the beach one foot deep in plastic, but the stench from the plastic, because it's absorbed petrochemicals, and I'll be talking more about that later, but it's just nauseating to actually be there and to see how terrible this problem is. And this is why we founded our organization, was to bring solutions to this problem, is not just endlessly clean it up, but to find the sources of where is this coming from, what manufacturer was it? Who used it? Which industry? 
so we can get to the source of the problem and bring long-term solutions to this. And here's another photo of Camillo Beach. What a beautiful sunrise I saw that morning and yet the horrifying sight of marine debris in front of it. Dean and I stayed there for two days working from sunup to sundown when there was no more light left to remove as much debris as we could from this shoreline which as I mentioned before was a foot deep. And in those two days of hard work, we removed over four million pieces of marine debris, just the two of us. This is me measuring down to the, find the sand, <laughs> a foot down. And Kuhuku on this island has a similar problem of accumulation of marine debris. So where does all this come from? This is still Kuhuku. You might have heard of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. It's an area that's twice the size of the US in total area. And it's uh, formed through the dumping and littering of plastic debris at sea by shipping uh, industries, fishing industries, military, international military, and cruise ships. So you've got a lot of debris that's getting dumped directly into the Pacific Ocean. Then you've got all of the Pacific Rim countries where where um, debris is flowing down streams, blowing out of cars, getting left at the shoreline, and all of that debris also ends up in the ocean. So you've got land-based um, litter, you've got in the ocean litter, and sometimes it's not even litter, it might be accidental, like you're at a picnic and a bag blows off the picnic table, um, or a balloon is released by mistake. Um, sometimes at sea, sh whole shipping containers are lost overboard, and that can also contribute to this problem. Um, so the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, also called the North Pacific Subtropical Gyre, is an area of converging currents that are rotating in a clockwise direction. And as you look at that diagram there, you can see that the currents are going straight towards Hawaii. So we're actually right in the midst of this Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Now it's not a big floating landfill mass that's going to hit Hawaii one day like an iceberg. It's actually teeny tiny, mostly little pieces of plastic all throughout the water column as not all plastic floats, only about 40% floats. So our island chain, which is right in the middle of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, acts like a comb to collect the debris as the currents are bringing it down. And as you can see, the currents are hitting the shorelines on the windward side. So that is where you would mostly expect to find plastic marine debris in Hawaii. So it's found from Camillo Beach all the way up to the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. So every single island in Hawaii is affected by the plastic marine debris problem. As you can see, the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands are not pristine. Even though they're a monument and they're protected, you can't protect from marine debris. On our island, you can see from this diagram that you can see plastic marine debris from Hanama Bay all the way to Kahuku, all along that windward shoreline. So unfortunately, plastic does not go away. Plastic lasts forever. It does photodegrade. So if you've left a piece of plastic, say, in the back of the car, it'll get brittle in the sun. It'll start to crack and break. And it will break into little pieces. But it doesn't biodegrade. It's never going to be eaten up by microorganisms and disappear forever. Unfortunately, it lasts forever. This is one of our volunteers trying to scoop out the little pieces of plastic in the water at Hanama Bay. That shimmer on the top of the ocean is actually mostly white pieces of plastic. And this is also the plastic on that day and the water sample. You see my hand is all covered in little plastic pieces and our legs were everything, you know, it was just everywhere. And this is Camillo, same problem at high tide, all the little pieces of plastic. Are you starting to see the problem for fish here? How are they going to swim around in this, let alone breathe? Um, and all those chemicals, I mean, it's terrible. And it looks like food, right? Little tiny pieces look like little eggs. I mean, that's really horrifying. This is me scooping out the water sample 
and there you go. So this gives you an idea of what the garbage patch looks like, the little pieces. So in comparison to other environmental disasters that are happening on our planet today, greenhouse gases, some of them last 20 years, some 200 years, up to thousands of years. Radiation, has, there can be uranium that has a half-life of 4 billion years, um, from 238 to 4 billion years. But when you get down to plastic, it's never going away. This stuff is lasting forever. So you can see why the plastic problem is one of the three greatest environmental disasters on our planet today. So what is this stuff plastic? We've got to find out. Um, if we're going to do something about it, we need to know all about it. So plastic is made from oil. About 10% of US oil consumption is used to make plastics. The plastics are then turned into little balls called nurdles. They also have a name called resin, resin pellets or pre-production plastic pellets. So these little tiny pellets that are about five millimeters in size, they're called a microplastic, are shipped off to factories, sometimes in rail cars and, and shipping containers. And occasionally they spill all over the ground and then get washed with the rain into the storm drain, which empties into the stream and empties into the ocean. Um, and those resin pellets are then sent off to factories and chemicals are added. So there is no plastic item in the world that is made without chemicals. Every single plastic thing has chemicals added to it, including antimony, vinyl chloride, styrene, bisphenol A, thylates, flame retardants like PBDE or polyvinyl alcohol. These are just a few of the common additives to plastics. Now why they add those is so that they can make the plastic hard and durable or soft and pliable or flame retardant or different qualities that they want plastic to have. But the thing about these additives is that they're physically um, inserted into the plastic, but they're not chemically bound to the plastic, which makes it easy for those chemicals to leach out. Now, how do those chemicals leach out of the plastic thing? Well, there's, very, um, there's a problem with stresses, and the stresses typically involve heat. So if you heat up plastic in the microwave, that adding of the heat to the plastic container will cause the release of the chemicals into your food or drink. The same thing with leaving, say, a plastic bottle in the sun. The UV light heating up the plastic bottle will cause the leaching of the chemicals. Washing a plastic item in the dishwasher also has an effect. Um, and in addition to heat, there is also the problem of acidic foods and drinks. So you never want to be using a styrofoam cup for wine or orange juice or something acidic because that will also cause the leaching of the chemicals. So let's get into these plastic numbers. Actually, that number, that triangle thing, that doesn't mean recyclable. It actually means the type of resin pellet that the plastic is made from to begin with. All right, so we've taken it to be recycling and that all oh, plastic's good and you can just shove it all in the recycling bin, but that's actually not the case. You can only recycle certain types of plastics in certain places. So e.g. in Honolulu or on Oahu, you can only recycle plastics with resin numbers, resin code numbers one and two. All right, the rest, forget about it. All right, now the thing about number one, these are your clear plastic bottles that you use for water, typically. They contain the chemical antimony. And antimony has been found to be um, a possible carcinogen. So you really don't want to be using um, a cancer-causing substance um, for your water bottle. PVC, this, this um, plastic is one of the least recyclable plastics. It off gases into the surrounding air, the chemicals. So if you've had that new car smell with the car or a vinyl shower curtain, when the hot water hits the shower curtain, it's going to be releasing into the air the toxic chemicals. And this is a very carcinogenic um, type of plastic. It's actually even called the poison plastic. 
Um, polystyrene. Styrene can leach from polystyrene plastic. It's toxic to the brain and the nervous system and has been found to adversely affect red blood cells, liver, kidney, and stomach in animal studies. So you really want to be avoiding polystyrene, especially for hot food, hot drinks, and acidic foods, like I mentioned before. And number seven, this one um, is used for lining cans, believe it or not. So canned foods and drinks are often lined with plastic that includes BPA or bisphenol A. And even these, Menehune water containers or any five gallon water dispenser can be leaching that chemical bisphenol A. BPA is a chemical that mimics the action of the human hormone estrogen. Therefore, it's referred to as an endocrine disruptor. And animal studies show that it wreaks havoc on the reproductive systems. BPA is also linked to prostate and breast cancer. Six billion pounds of BPA are produced each year. And according to a study by the Center of Disease Control, BPA is found in the urine of 95% of the people tested in the US. You might think, well, maybe there's some safe plastics. Well, actually, there aren't any safe plastics because a study in 2011 found that all plastic numbers from one to seven, including BPA-free plastic products, leach chemicals having estrogenic activity. So what's this estrogenic activity? Well, it's to do with mucking up your, your endocrine system. And your endocrine system consists of a series of glands that produce hormones, including the pituitary, thyroid, adrenal, and reproductive glands. These hormones regulate various functions such as metabolism, sleep, growth, development, and reproduction. And your endocrine system influences almost every cell, organ, and function in our bodies. So having these uh, synthetic chemical additives that are pretending to be a proper um, hormone in your body, but they're not, they're a, they're a fake hormone, um, mucking up your endocrine system is really harmful. So endocrine disruptors are chemicals that interfere with the hormonal or endocrine system. They mimic naturally occurring hormones such as estrogen. They interfere with or block natural hormones from being made or their functioning. And they can bind to receptors within cells, blocking the hormones from binding and stop normal signals from occurring, which means that your body fails to respond. You might be wondering how much of these endocrine disruptors do we have to worry about? Well, actually, um, any amount of these endocrine disruptors can cause harm. They've actually found that a very small dose, like in the part per billion range, um, can cause endocrine disruption. So in other words, a very low dose of these chemicals can interfere with your endocrine system. So what do you do about this? Well, the best step is to avoid all plastic for food and drink where possible, and particularly hot food and drink and acidic foods and drinks. Better choices are glass, porcelain, ceramic, and stainless steel. So the impacts of marine debris on marine life include habitat destruction, where large nets, cargo nets, and other fishing gear plus other marine debris can sink through being fouled up with organisms. They become heavy and sink and cover over coral, smother it, block out the sunlight, stop the coral from being able to grow and reproduce, and uh, the coral will then die. This is a net that Dean and I had to cut into pieces in order to get it off the beach because what was underneath it were huge chunks of coral like this that had been ripped off the reef by this scraggly little net. Um, so you can see the destruction that the fishing gear has caused. Here is a piece of coral that had grown on a crate and one on a, a net, a buoy. And these um, pieces of coral that took about 10 years or more to grow then on the wrong item, then they wash ashore, the, the buoy washes ashore, and the coral dies. Another way that fishing gear and other marine debris causes harm to marine life 
is on shorelines and our endangered monk seal comes ashore to give birth, nurse young um, and rest. And so do endangered turtles come ashore to nest. And they can't do that with, um, with a beach full of plastic. Entanglement is another issue for marine life. This is a sea turtle entangled in a cargo net. It only has its mouth to try to free itself. So as it struggles, it gets more and more entangled. So we've been um, researching the plastic marine debris problem. And what we've found is that a lot of the marine debris is coming from the fishing industry, such as the ghost nets I was talking about before. Why they're called ghost nets is because after the fishermen have discarded the net or cut it free, or maybe it, it, um, it accidentally became loose, that net keeps on fishing without the fishermen. And it keeps catching more animals and killing them. And then they decompose. And this net that's made of plastic then floats somewhere else and entangles and harms another animal. So that's why they're called ghost nets. Also, there's such a thing as fish aggregating devices. So in talking to some fishermen, we found out that sometimes they deliberately dump plastic marine debris into the ocean, making great big balls of it, so net and rope all tangled up together to make what's called a fish aggregating device, where the little fish come underneath this mass and um, hang out there. All right, so it's a place where they can attract fish when there normally wouldn't be anything like that in the open ocean, um, which is causing more harm because they don't, they leave those fish aggregating devices out there. They don't go scoop them up or anything like that. So unfortunately, when you buy seafood, when you buy fish and other seafood to eat, you're supporting an industry that's causing a lot of harm through the habitat destruction I was talking about with the coral reefs and so on and the, the endangered and threatened species habitat, through the entanglement problem of these marine animals where the fishing nets keep fishing. And I think we all need to think about that. Do we want to support an industry that's causing so much harm? And here's one of those rope balls. That, oh, by the way, these are all things we've removed from the shoreline. And it's a very um, hard process to get this stuff off the reef because it's often tangled on there. And we have to get knives and work at it. This one here was 100 feet long. I know it doesn't look like it, but most of it's buried in the sand. And Dean and I had to dig that whole thing out of there and cut it into chunks and drag it down the beach and up the bank of sand. And this took five days for us to remove this huge um, chunk of rope. It was this about like this, and we had to cut through every piece of rope. This is an endangered monk seal that we came across one Sunday morning at Kahuku Beach. And she was visibly distressed. She was having a hard time breathing. When I took a closer look, I could see the rope around her midsection there and it was having an effect on her lungs. We called Noah immediately and they had to drive up from Honolulu and it took about two hours. So we stayed with the animal and um, you know, luckily she, she stuck around and were able to assist with the removal of that rope. And you can see the line where the rope was because it, cut, it started to cut into her flesh. But luckily, she survived. And she's one of the monk seals that's given birth on Kauai in the past. Unfortunately for other animals, there may not be somebody around to save them. And with the animal uh, with the cone around his mouth, he couldn't open his mouth to eat. He was stuck in this eel cone. And um, it was starting to cut into his flesh as well, which can cause infections and wounds. Um, the other monk seal on the other side um, was entangled in a rope and net. Luckily, there was a diver there to release him that day. But unfortunately, sometime later, the same animal was down at Makai Pier, and somebody had left a net there unattended, and that monk seal died. It drowned. 
because these animals that are air breathing, they need to be able to reach the surface to breathe, such as whales, dolphins, monk seals, and sea turtles. So if they can't get that air, um, they're going to suffocate and die. Here's a lace and albatross entangled in monofilament line. Monofilament line is very dangerous to animals because it acts almost like a knife. It can sever off flippers, it can sever off wings. It just shouldn't be left lying around at the shoreline. Here's a shark entangled. I wouldn't want to untangle that, would you? And here's a jellyfish, another thing I wouldn't want to try to untangle either. Okay, ingestion. All sea turtle hatchlings, even including green sea turtle hatchlings, like to eat jellyfish. And most people think that a green sea turtle is just going to eat seagrass and algae and all the green vegetarian things. But actually, when they're um, young, they all eat jellyfish. This is a green sea turtle eating a plastic bag. For the leatherback turtle, which are the largest sea turtle in the world, and they've been around since the time of the dinosaurs, their only diet is jellyfish. So a plastic bag floating in the ocean looks like a jellyfish to them. This is typically what we find when we do beach cleanups. We find the knot remaining of the plastic bag after marine life have eaten off the rest. So this is a common item. It's even on our data card written as not plastic bag, but plastic bag knot. This is the contents of a dead sea turtle. And you can see that it eats a variety of items not only just the soft plastic items like the bags, but they also eat hard plastic things as well. So it's a whole variety of different types of plastics. Even balloons can be eaten by sea turtles. With the albatrosses in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands, scientists have found that 100% of Laysan and black-footed albatross chicks have ingested plastic. The Laysan albatrosses, there's about um, 500 breeding pairs of albatrosses in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, and they give birth to about one chick a year, and half of those chicks die. So that's a quarter of a million dead baby albatrosses every year in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. So how the scientists know that it's 100% of the birds that are being fed plastic is because they look at what's called a bolus. A bolus is what a young bird throws up before they take flight for the first time. And these boluses, if you take a closer look, you'll see that there's plastic fishing line and rope in there. There's also other pieces of plastic in this bolus. So when they went around picking up all the boluses off the ground on Midway Island, they found every single bolus contained plastic. Now, for those animals that aren't able to throw the bolus up because they're too impacted by the plastic, there's the dead ones. And on examination of all of the dead carcasses, they found plastic in all of those as well. Now, here's another one. And if you look closely, you'll see the colors that the young bird had been fed. Red is predominant in this picture, and yellow. So the parents are picking out the colors that most resemble their food. So how this happens is that the parents take turns to fly off to the ocean to go scoop up what they'll um, scoop up some food, like squid and fish eggs. Those are the typical things that these albatrosses eat. Um, but unfortunately, where they're going to fish is also where there's a lot of floating plastic, the garbage patch. And so they're looking down and they're going, oh, look at that lighter. That looks like food. Look at that toothbrush, that toy, that bottle cap. So they're scooping all of that up. They're flying back to the nest. They're regurgitating it for their chick. And then this is the result, is that that poor little baby bird had been fed all of this plastic. Now, ingesting plastic like that can cause blockages for the, for the animal. Sometimes the plastic's sharp. It can cause a laceration where the animal can bleed to death. Um, they also only get their moisture from their food so they can dehydrate as well. And of course, starvation from not having any of its proper food. 
airsoft pellets have been found in albatrosses and other seabirds. These are used in, it's a toy game actually, um, where people load up these plastic bullets and shoot them into the environment up to 10,000 per person per game. And these are the kinds of things that are found inside of these dead animals. So moving on to fish, this is a lancet fish that was caught off Honolulu. And this is the plastic that was found inside of that fish. You can see the rope and the large piece of a plastic bag about this, this long. And salps are um, related to the jellyfish family and their job is to filter ocean water. So this salp has ingested plastic. If you look closely, you can see that plastic there. This is a jelly collected by Seymour out of the University of Hawaii, Manoa. And they collected these jellyfish out of the ocean in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. On examination under a microscope, they found that a lot of them had plastic in their stomachs. OK, lanternfish are the most common fish in the open ocean. And these are the little fish that the bigger fish eat. And when Algalita Marine Research Foundation went to the garbage patch and, and got 600 of these fish and opened them up, they found plastic inside of them up to 25 pieces per fish. 50% had ingested plastic fragments. And back to our Eden bottles, OK? So you can see that, that fish and marine life are definitely ingesting plastic as we can see the evidence in these bottles. Now, it doesn't stop there. Actually, plankton at the very base of the food chain is also ingesting plastic. And this is the evidence right here. So you can see on this slide here the um, plastic particles in the gut. And then here is the plastic particles in the fecal pellets showing that plankton is eating plastic. So in other words, all marine life from tiny little plankton all the way to the biggest whales are eating plastic in the ocean. So not only is the, the plankton ingesting plastic that includes manufactured chemicals that are leaching out of that plastic, but in addition, marine debris becomes more toxic in the ocean from the accumulation of persistent organic pollutants. These are things like DDT and DDE that were banned pesticides back in the 70s, and they still exist in the open ocean. Also PCBs and dioxins. These POPs, or persistent organic pollutants, they accumulate onto plastic up to one million times more concentrated on the surface of the plastic than in the surrounding seawater, proving that Marine debris is toxic. It's not just ordinary plastic anymore. It's toxic plastic. And those chemicals are also being passed into the fatty tissues of the animal and causing endocrine disruption. So PCBs, DDT, DDE, BPA, thiolates, and all those other plastic chemicals we're talking about bioaccumulate up through the food chain and get greater in greater and greater numbers up through the food chain and accumulate into the fatty tissues of fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals, causing endocrine disruption. And because humans and seals and dolphins and whales are at the top of the food chain, they have the highest levels of those endocrine disruptors in their fatty tissue which is yet another reason why not to eat fish, because the fish is eating maybe a little fish that ate another fish that ate the plankton, and so all of those chemicals are accumulating and accumulating, and you go to buy your fish, and you're not going to know it's safe. When you open it up, you might go, oh, I don't see any plastic. This must be safe to eat. But you would have to then have it chemically tested to make sure that there are none of these chemicals in it, which is highly unlikely that you'll find none because there's so much plastic in the ocean today. Now, these endocrine disruptors affect your brain, nervous system, the immune system, the thyroid, metabolism, adrenal glands, sex hormones, reproduction, 
and sex ratio balance. So you might have heard of autoimmune diseases. They're actually a disease of the immune system. And interestingly enough, they're finding it to be a Western world disease. And one of the triggers for autoimmune disease is actually plastic chemicals. So you really just don't want to be eating fish um, because of those chemicals that are in it. So endocrine disruptors can cause heart conditions, thyroid conditions, prostate and breast cancer, obesity, diabetes, low sperm count, and feminization of male species. So there's been quite a lot of studies on this. And I can give you some examples of the feminization of male species. One example is male fish turning into female fish or growing female parts like egg sacs. In humans, they've been studying humans in the Arctic. They're called the Inuit people. And they've actually found that the um, sex ratio balance has changed. So they've found that there are twice as many girls being born than boys in communities that are mainly eating a seafood and meat diet. So they're eating walruses and polar bears and um, all kinds of animals. And they're finding that it's due to those endocrine disruptors in the pregnant women that are causing there to be a change in that sex ratio balance to swing more towards female babies than male babies. And in fact, in one village, they found only girls being born and no boys at all. So if this continues, this feminization of male species, which is going on all over the world and all kinds of animals, um, vertebrates, what will happen is that populations will decline to the point that there will be mass extinction. And we are in the Anthropocene era now, which is um, human-caused destruction, causing extinction of many species. And plastic and chemicals are way up there on the list of causes for that. So these chemicals that are causing all this trouble, you would think that the government would check them and make sure they're safe and make sure they don't cause any harm. Like, we're probably all thinking, well, why can you still buy food in styrofoam if it's a problem? Well, the trouble is, there's 80,000 chemicals on the market today, and only 200 have been tested for safety. So you can't just believe that what you're buying in the stores and things like that is safe because the chemicals aren't being tested. So let's get to the good part about what can you do to make a difference. So let's start with the easy ones that don't cost any money and are very simple to do. So one of them is very, very important. Tie up your trash bag every time you put it in the rubbish bin because the open bags or just tossing something in that's not in a bag what ends up happening, we've observed, is when on a windy day, the rubbish truck comes along to take the trash away, out fly the pieces of plastic, particularly things like bags and styrofoam, because they're easily wind blown. So it's super important to tie up your bags. Reusing is another very easy thing to do. So bringing your own reusable bag every time you go shopping, and I don't just mean grocery shopping or farmer's market shopping, but when you're buying takeout food, you're going to the hardware, you're buying books, shoes, clothes, anything, is remember to bring your bag. So how we do that is we put our bag on the door handle with your purse in it and your shopping list and anything important, um, or put it on the front seat of the car, again with your wallet in it and things like that to make sure that you remember to bring that bag when you go. If you forget, you can always ask for a box at the checkout counter. Quite often, various places have boxes available. Um, you can also see in this picture that we're ordering our vegetarian sushi um, when we ate sushi. Uh, we don't anymore because the the seaweed. But um, you can see that we've got glass bowls for that. So we call ahead and we let the takeout place know we're bringing our own bowls in, and then we hand them to them at the counter, and they fill it up for us. 
And we've checked with the state health department. There's absolutely no law saying you can't do that. So if anyone says it's unsanitary or anything like that, that's not the case. Um, the health department told me that, of course, the bowl will be clean because you're eating out of it. You're not going to give them something dirty. So it is allowed. Um, you can take another step beyond that. So if you're already using your own reusable bag for your shopping, then here's the next thing that you can do. Bring your own cotton produce bags for your fruits and vegetables. Now this is really important too because we're trying to help save and protect the sea turtles and as I mentioned before, um, the leatherback turtle, actually that's the most endangered sea turtle in the world and they eat only jellyfish which a plastic bag floating in the ocean looks like. So being able to go and do your grocery shopping and not come home with any plastic bags means that you're helping to save and protect those animals. And this is Dean getting his um, oranges in his reusable cotton produce bag. And we talked about takeout bowls, bring your own bowls for takeout, but also when you eat out. So you might want to remember to just bring a handy bag with you, put it under the table with your glass bowl in it so that you don't have to take any styrofoam home with you or any kind of other disposable container that you're right to go with the leftovers. You can just load it into your glass bowl. And what's really nice about this is you can put it straight in the fridge when you get home. You know, you don't have to transfer it into anything else. And you've helped save and protect our planet again. These are the kinds of vegan choices and lifestyle changes I was mentioning at the very start is helping to save and protect our marine life and, and all of the animals on our planet today um, by making these choices that are healthy for you as well as healthy for the environment. Because our health and the environment's health are completely tied together. One is good for the other and vice versa. Here's another um, great idea, is to bring your own reusable utensil set. This is showing the bamboo ones, um, but you can also, of course, bring metal ones. Um, but this whole thing about using plastic forks and knives and things and throwing them out after using them for 10 minutes or 20 minutes is incredibly wasteful because that plastic lasts forever on our planet. And unfortunately, these types, you know, the um, plastic forks and plastic spoons, they actually get ingested by lace and albatrosses even, can swallow a whole fork, you know. So really it's important to not be wasteful and to always think about the environment as well as marine life in our daily choices. Look at all this trash. These are all forks just thrown. Actually, these were all pulled out of a stream by a partner organization of ours um, on the North Shore. So they, so they have all those takeout places there and people were just throwing away their plastic forks and spoons after one use. Using a reusable bottle for your coffee, for your cold drinks. You can get insulated ones now like this that keep your drink cold or hot. Um, and these are a great idea. Why? Because you don't want to be drinking out of those, those clear plastic water bottles for a couple of reasons. One is the antimony, the cancer-causing substance that leaches out of that bottle. And the other one is the cap, because those little caps that are often red and yellow and orange, they get eaten by seabirds, like lace and albatrosses. So staying away from water bottles, if you're both on a personal level and if you are running an event. So you want to think if you're having a party or a conference or any kind of gathering of people, it's much better to have a dispenser with the water available rather than giving out individual bottles um, because of the problem for people's health, the antimony, and the environment and marine life like the cap. Reducing, so also talking about large gatherings, this is another way that you can help, is not providing plastic plates and spoons and cups and things, but go for the compostable alternatives to plastics. Now, these compostable alternatives are not made with any 
chemicals. So there's no um, antimony or BPA or any of those things, but there's no um, petrochemicals either. So there's no benzene and all of those nasty um, oil type products as well. Um, these are made from compostable things, from vegetables such as sugarcane, potato starch, um, bamboo, hemp, there's all kinds of varieties these days. Um, and this is a much better alternative to plastic. And they also don't leach chemicals either, which is a good thing. So here are some made from sugarcane. Even the cutlery is made from sugarcane. All right, now we're moving on to another easy way to make a difference. So saying no thanks to unnecessary plastics is a really easy way to help the environment. Getting your sushi, they quite often put a little plastic grass thing in there. Do we really need that plastic grass? Like, does it make our life better to have that plastic grass there? I don't think so. So it's when you're ordering, you just have to remember when you're ordering to just to say, no plastic grass, please, and give them your glass bottles or your metal containers or, or whatever. So saying no thanks to that. Um, going to Subway or any of those places that where you get a sandwich and they've wrapped it up in a piece of paper and then the next thing they want to do is put it in a plastic bag. So you can say no thanks to that plastic bag. Plastic straws, how long do we use those for? Maybe 10 minutes, 20 minutes, and then it lasts forever. So the best thing to do is say I don't need a straw thanks when you order a drink or you can bring your own glass straw there's metal straws, there's bamboo straws now, reusable straws. And they've even gone back to paper straws, I see, which we used to have when I was a kid. Okay, plastic lays. This came in just a few years back. They apparently ran out of flowers and they started putting plastic inserts between real flowers. And this is the lay that we found washed up on a beach on Lanai when we were doing a clean up there. So the best idea is never to give a plastic lay. Always give a natural lay made of flowers or seeds or leaves. It's so much more appreciated and it's not going to be on our planet forever harming it. Here's another um, good choice. So all these lighters, that's what ends up in particularly seabirds. They go for these. But wooden matches, a much better choice. Giving a gift to children. There's so many plastic toys out there. But if everybody starts to not buy those and to look for the wooden ones or the metal ones or other um, cardboard, paper, there's all kinds of choices out there as far as toys and gifts for children. And what you find is that when you start voting with your dollars and deciding, OK, I'm not going to give any plastic toys anymore and you only buy non-plastic toys, then the stores get the idea. They're like, wow, plastic toys don't sell anymore. Let's make more wooden ones. And the same thing with drinks. Like I've noticed over the time that we've been doing this work that there used to be lots and lots of plastic bottles in stores and now you go into particular stores and you see wow look at all the glass bottles of drink that change happens through consumer choices through voting with your dollars and deciding how what am i going to support am i going to support the polluters and the the um, materials and items that are harmful to animals and the environment or am i going to buy great long-lasting gifts that are good for the environment Microbeads, you might have heard of microbeads. They are very, very tiny little pieces of plastic that have been added to personal care products like toothpaste, shampoo, shaving cream, sunscreen, makeup, just a whole range of things. And if you remember at the beginning of my talk about being vegan and taking you know, more steps than just what you eat, into things like what kind of toothpaste you buy, you might want to make sure you're not buying any toothpaste with microbeads in it. So how do you find that out? Let's take a look. See this word right here? Polyethylene. So if you see that word listed on the ingredients of the toothpaste, then you know that there's microbeads in that toothpaste. 
So let's take a look at what microbeads look like. You can see they're very, very small. This is a blown up photograph of microbeads. And these microbeads came out of this scrub, one of these scrubs. And the reason they added those microbeads in there, supposedly, is to help, you know, exfoliate your skin. But if we take a look at the microbeads, look how they're round. Most of them are big, I mean, not big, but the bigger ones are completely round. In other words, they're not going to do anything at all for your skin. So you actually have to use more product using microbeads to try to get that exfoliating effect than if they had left the natural ingredients in the scrub, such as the coconut husk pieces, the apricot kernel. Um, there's just all kinds of sand, salt. There were all kinds of natural materials that um, personal care products such as scrubs used to contain all the way up to the mid 90s. And then all of a sudden they started putting plastic in these products. Luckily, President Obama signed uh, an act that will get rid of the microbeads. But unfortunately, until all the manufacturers stop, because it's kind of a rolling law, it doesn't all go in effect immediately. So you really do still need to keep an eye out for this word on everything personal care product, from makeup to shampoo and, and so on. OK, so also, here's some other names to look out for polypropylene, PMMA, typically on makeup a lot of the time. This one also in makeup, acrylates copolymer, acrylates cross polymer. So those are the ones that you, the names you want to look out for. Now, in addition to microbeads, you might have heard of microfibers. Microfibers come off anything synthetic that you wear and then put in the washing machine and then the little pieces of plastic come off and the washing machine has a filter that's able to collect it, then the wastewater treatment plant can't collect the microbeads, it can't collect the microfibers, and so all of those microbeads and microfibers end up in the ocean getting ingested by the base of the food chain, the plankton again. So wherever possible, and we need everyone's help with this, is look for the natural fibers like cotton and bamboo, hemp, um, silk, wool, you name it. All of the natural fibers are way better choices for your clothing. Um, what's going on is, you know those plastic water bottles that, we, that have been recycled, they get turned into fleece clothing, fleece jackets, fleece bedding, made from a number one plastic bottle. And the, the plastic from that fleece clothing then goes out into the washing water and down the drain and out into the ocean. So it's not a good idea to buy number one bottles and think, oh, it's OK, they're recyclable. I just throw them in the recycle bin. Well, actually, it's, they're still causing a lot of harm by the item they're made into. A few more things to avoid. This one might sound good, ocean plastic, but actually it's made with that recycled toxic marine debris. It's harmful to your health, it's harmful to the environment, it's not green at all, so avoid at all costs. You do not want to be washing your dishes and your hands with this. K-cups, terrible idea of putting a plastic cup into a machine, add hot water, guess what? Your coffee has all these chemicals in it, as well as the coffee. So, and it's a disposable, one-use plastic item again. So definitely avoid those. Pods, I mentioned washing detergent at the beginning of my talk. These are terrible also. What happens is that there is no magic solution to plastic. You cannot get rid of it. It's not going to just disappear. It's not going to just dissolve in water and go away. Actually, what happens with the polyvinyl alcohol, it's a type of plastic that wraps those pods, is it clogs up your dishwasher and your washing machine. In dorms here in Hawaii, they've actually banned the students from using pods because the washing machines were getting clogged with plastic. So please don't use this. And the polyvinyl alcohol is actually toxic to fish. So you don't want to use that. If you do have these at home, put a little hole. <laughs> 
tip it all out and throw that plastic covering away. And once you're done with the pods, never buy them again. And this is how we need consumers to make those better choices to help our um, planet and marine life. And the latest thing, styrofoam on roofs. I could not believe it when I saw it. I was just like, what? <laughs> Are they really doing this? I had to see for myself. All, this, all those layers of styrofoam that's going up underneath a metal shingle on roofs. And the result, this is um, actually near Coca Marina, is teeny tiny little pieces of styrofoam in the hundreds of thousands to millions of pieces of styrofoam are going into the marina from the roofing project. So being vegan even extends to bigger things like what kind of fences am I going to get? Plastic vinyl ones or wooden ones? What kind of roofing am I going to get? Styrofoam with metal or something better? Um, but you always want to choose the non-plastic item. That is the much better choice. Because our health and that of the environment are intertwined and one affects the other. So please, vote with your dollars. What products and industries do you want to support? Our everyday choices, including what we eat and what we buy, can make a difference to protecting our health, marine life, and that of our ocean planet. So with that, um, I wish you well with making those lifestyle changes. And I hope you're inspired today to go out and help protect our marine life, seabirds, and ocean coastal environment. Thank you. Yes, anyone got some questions? Yeah, so we don't promote because it's impossible to say don't use any plastic because the computer's plastic, the car part's plastic, the sunglasses are plastic, the cell phone's plastic. I mean, there's lots and lots of plastic, right? But there's certain plastic items that are only used for a short space of time where there are better alternatives, and that's the place to start. So when I was talking about New Year's resolutions, make sure you don't get overwhelmed with this. Make sure just to pick one thing about what I said today and one new thing that you can do, like whether it's look for the microbeads or buy more cotton clothing or something like that. Just start with one thing. Because that one thing that you do, if you do it consistently, makes a very big difference if everybody starts doing that. And thanks to all of you for coming and attending today. And I hope you learned something too. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, mahalo. Have a safe return home today. Mm -hmm.